without further ado, I'll turn things over. I believe Dr. Huang is starting uh, first. Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you, Matt. Um, and yeah, so Dr. Huang and Dr. Shruthers will present the first case, and then uh, I'll present two cases together with Dr. Shannon and then Dr. Ng as well. So Dr. Wang, please take it away. Yeah, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, can you see my screen well? Yes, it looks good. Okay, perfect. So I start with uh, case number one. It's from a 54 year old woman who presents to the ED with a chief complaint of lower extremity wounds. Um, Dr. Stresses, would you please start with the clinical information? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, all right, um, so this is a case of a um, patient that I saw about two months ago on the inpatient Harborview Nephrology Service. <clears throat> so in terms of her demographics, um, she's a 54-year-old Somali-speaking woman who presented to the ED with a chief complaint of lower extremity wounds. And um, she had moved to Seattle from Nebraska about a week prior and um, was really, unfortunately, not able to provide much information about her past medical history. Um, but she did have the following medications with her. And I won't go through all of these, but they were most notable for um, oral cyclophosphamide as well as prednisone, which she was taking daily. Um, her labs at the time of presentation uh, were notable for um, kind of some mild leukopenia, um, anemia, and then her uh, BMP was notable for creatinine of 5.3. Um, and so this was all the information we had for about 24 hours, and we had to go on a little bit of a wild goose chase to get records. Um, do you mind going to the next slide? Um, and so after about 24 hours, we were finally able to get uh, records sent over from her prior nephrologist in Nebraska's office. Um, and we were able to find out that her past medical history was significant for uh, type 2 diabetes, um, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and hypothyroidism. Um, and then she uh, was also felt to have uh, CKD stage 4 with a baseline creatinine of around 4. And this had been attributed to membranous nephropathy uh, with a positive serum um, PLA2R antibody. Um, unfortunately, there were no titers uh, available, and um, we were never able to get titers on this. Um, we did receive a brief pathology report from her biopsy, which she had undergone um, about six months earlier, uh, which confirmed the presence of membranous nephropathy. Um, and she had uh, two out of nine globally sclerotic glomeruli, one out of nine segmentally sclerotic, and then moderate interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. Um, and then per the nephrologist note, the following treatments were attempted. Uh, so she had initially received rituximab, um, we know that she received at least one dose of uh, one gram. It's unclear whether she received um, the full regime. Um, and then she was uh, switched to cyclopho oral cyclophosphamide and prednisone in September of 2022 uh, due to non-response. So we uh, did get some additional workup during her hospitalization. Um, over the next few days from the initial consult, her creatinine did trend down from about 5.3 to 4.3. Um, she'd had a renal ultrasound in the first 24 hours, which showed normal sized kidneys with slightly echogenic parenchyma. Um, and then we did order a um, serum anti-PLA2R, uh, which was pending for uh, the duration of her stay. And um, I recall discussing this case at, at Harborview Professor Rounds, and I think there were kind of some mixed opinions about rebiopsying the patient. Um, but ultimately, I decided to rebiopsy her because um, she didn't have a very good understanding of her underlying kidney disease. Um, when you asked her, she stated that she had been told she had an infection in her kidneys that was treatable. And um, I felt that if I better understood why she wasn't responding and kind of the current state of her kidney parenchyma, I'd be able to counsel her better. And so a biopsy was performed uh, mainly for prognostic information and I'll pass it off to Dr. Huang now. Okay, thank you. So this is what we get from the renal cortex. Um, it's a very nice core. We have about 20 to 21 gram per level section. 
Um, and among these five to seven gram are globally sclerosed. So it's about 33 to 40%. And there is quite some um, substantial chronic parenchymal injury of at least moderate interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. And when we take a closer look of the tubules, so correlating with the elevation of creatinine, so the tubules do show uh, some acute injurious changes, which you can see here. The lumen is dilated and the uh, epithelia is really attenuated. And some of the nuclei, they look really reactive, make you think about some viropathic, I mean, effects, but it's not the case here. It just means the nuclei really very, uh, looks very reactive. Okay, um, and then we when we take a look at the glum, so they do, uh, so most of them show this kind of change. Um, what we can see at this low power, kind of low power image is that you do see some of the um, peripheral capillary walls, they are not black stained anymore. They have these uh, replaced by this eosinophilic material. Uh, this is a closer look. So the green arrow is pointing to these eosinophilic deposits. And then um, in some area, you can see those fuzziness, kind of the spikes of the um, basement membrane, the uh, black, black spikes here. So this is a, a very good uh, membranous nephropathy pattern, uh, which uh, I mentioned already. There is thickened glomerular basement membrane and epimembranous eosinophilic deposits. So for these involved by membranous nephropathy pattern, about five to eight show segmental sclerosis. So that's about 30 to 40%. The green arrow here is pointing to the segmental sclerosis lesion um, here, here. And some of these uh, also show this adhesion to the Bowman's capsule. Um, this area, I wouldn't pay too much attention because this is probably the, um, the vascular hand of the glum. So um, the green arrow are pointing to an uh, area with segmental sclerosis. So for the glum on the right side, which is a nice contrast, because uh, it shows a membranous nephropathy pattern, but without um, segmental sclerosis. So if this is uh, if this is the uh, vascular hyaline, but we have to um, take closer look on different levels for sure. Okay, now I have a question here. Um, Initially, we designed at this, this as a poll, but we decided not to do it today. Um, so on the left side, it's a, PA, uh, it's a Jones silver staining. And on the right side, it's from the same glom showing um, um, PAS stain uh, section. So the question um, I'm gonna ask, and I also want you to take a moment to think about is that what kind of lesion is this? I can give you some options. Um, so the glum is showing the thick fuzziness um, basement membrane, and it could be a cellular crescent, um, or it could be collapsing FSGS, or it could be combined um, thick fuzziness glomerular basement membrane and collapsing FSGS. Or it, uh, another option is um, membranous pattern plus, um, crescent lesion. So if you want, you can tap in the chat, chat or, um, you know, think about what this could be. I'll, I'll give you the answer in a moment. Let me see. So this is, this is actually a um, membranous nephropathy pattern. And on top of that, we have collapsing FSGS. So this is many uh, in this uh, segment. We could appreciate uh, those very prominent uh, epithelial hypertrophy with those prominent eosinophilic protein droplets. Same here, it's even more obvious on the PAS staining. And some of the loops, uh, they are not open anymore. Um, it's collapsed. So I'm gonna have a, a more detailed slide to, in, to talk about collapsing FSGS. Another gum um, 
on the left, so those those two images are from the same gram uh, of different levels. So on the left side, we raise a question uh, for ourselves. Could this be uh, a crescent? Because we, we do see some really prominent epithelial cells that are more than two level thick, but it's not like definite, definitive um, crescent for us yet. So we look at the same ground from a different level. And as you can see here on the right side, it's actually showing very nice segmental sclerosis here. So we prefer that um, this is a ground with kind of prominent epithelial cells, but it's not a crescentic lesion. It's probably reaction to the segmental sclerosis. And we do not see segmental necrosis or uh, disruption of growth marrow basement membrane. Now, uh, IF, so uh, IgG shows this very nice granular staining along the growth marrow basement membrane and same at C3. It's kind of very strong. Um, and then we did a POA2R. It's weakly stained, but it's showing the same pattern, um, <clears throat> excuse me, along the groomer basement membrane. And in some area, you could even appreciate the granule, granular staining um, here and there. So it's, it's um, POA2R weak, but it's still positive. And then on EM, uh, this is showing you, so this is a, a capillary loop here, and this is uh, the lumen, and we have the endothelial cell uh, lining very nicely. The glomerular basement memory is showing uh, those remote, uh, it's thickened uh, and uh, showing these numerous immune deposits, electron dense immune deposits. The overlying portal size is extensive if you, uh, Effaced with those microvillous transformation. So this is a zoom in image to show you those subepithelial um, deposits. You know, um, some are like intro uh, membranous, and also there is associated remodeling change of the glomerular basement membrane. So what I want to emphasize here is that there is no mesangial deposits, there is no subendothelial deposits, and there is no tuber reticular inclusions. So all of this uh, supports a primary membranous nephropathy process. So for diagnosis, uh, this is membranous nephropathy, POA2R positive. Uh, there is also a concomitant collapsing FSGS. Uh, there is focal global glomerular sclerosis and also acute tuber injury probably from the um, uh, proteinuria of the membranous nephropathy um, process. And there is at least moderate interstitial fibrosis and tuber atrophy. Um, there is some vascular uh, changes as well. So for what is collapsing FSGS? By definition, on light microscopy, uh, what you can see is there is either a segmental or global glomerular top to collapse. Um, and you could also see the overlying um, epithelial cells. They are hyperplastic. Uh, they are hypertrophic. Some can show this very prominent eosinophilic protein droplets. Kind of a help, helpful clue, but it's not. But when you see the protein droplets, it's not like definitive for FSGS. Uh, what you also want to see is uh, the uh, collapsing of the glomerular tufts. Uh, some sometimes you could appreciate foam cells within those, uh, but that's okay. And for the um, different etiologies of FSGS, there are various etiologies. Uh, like viral infection, COVID-19 and HIV, medications, ischemia, and other genetic causes. So very importantly, the patient is of Somalian uh, ascendancy. So the question we raise here is that, should we do an Apple L1 genetic testing or not? So for the G1 and G2 allele, uh, alleles of Apple L1, they're most prevalent in West uh, Africa, as, as you can see here, um, the 
The area with these red and brownish dots uh, have a prevalence of high risk APOIL1 genotype about 20 to 30 percent or greater than 30 percent. And for those ethnic groups in Ghana and Nigeria, they have about over 40 percent uh, prevalence. However, for uh, people of Somalian uh, origin, they for G1 and G2 prevalence is actually uh, surprisingly low. It's about zero, it's like zero percent or two percent. So that's why we uh, decided we 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 don't we uh, didn't do Apple L1 uh, testing for for her for this patient. And for collapsing uh, glomerulopathy co coexisting with membranous uh, nephritis, which is the own term for membranous nephropathy, um, it's it's been reported before. And especially in, so it's like, uh, this is from three patients with HIV negative status. The take home message here is that it's associated with worse prognosis and it's associated with relatively rapid disease progression, um, even with aggressive therapy, which is uh, unfortunate. And for uh, for pathogenesis, I want to um, talk a little bit um, here as well. So this is a, a study. Uh, they in, they included about twenty patients with both membranous and FSGS lesions, and um, they use the primary membranous uh, and primary FSGS as disease controls. So twenty have both, and then about sixty five membranous and fifty six with. FSGS in the primary. So for those with both membranous FS, FSGS, they usually uh, present with older age, less proteinuria, uh, higher albumin, and better renal function on biopsy. And they usually um, present with higher stages of membranous nephropathy, and there is no cell cellular variant of F FSGS and seen in these patients, and they have more common chronic parenchyma injury uh, compared with the primary uh, forms. And also um, about 80% of them show anti-POA2 antibody positive and about 70% IgG4 predominant. So this is kind of similar to the image of a primary membranous nephropathy process. Um, so the, the conclusion they, uh, they draw here is that for those with combined membranous nephropathy and FSGS, they may share uh, the same underlying pathogenesis with the primary membranous nephropathy and the FSGS is favored to be a secondary process to the primary membranous nephropathy. Okay, that, that's all I have. Um, thank you all for your attention. And uh, I'm happy to take questions. Should I take questions now or uh, at the end? I think well, we can. Good. I think questions now would be would be good if uh, anyone has questions for Dr. Huang or Dr. Struthers, I suppose, clinical uh, follow-up. Sarah, did the patient come back? Uh, sorry, there was a lot of feedback. Um, well, she came to see me in clinic once where we reviewed the results and... Um, you know, I had started tapering her immunosuppression a bit when she left the hospital, just because I was, I was worried what the biopsy was going to show. I did not, I think I continued the prednisone taper at her follow-up um, because she actually came in with an um, active zoster infection. Um, I was going to see her back a month later, and then we received notification that she wanted a second opinion. Um, and so Dr. Corallo was nice enough to put her, put her on his schedule for a few days later. And then we received a message that she apparently flew to India looking for a second opinion. So um, no one knows where she is right now. I guess she's in India getting a second opinion. Um, yeah, very, um, very interesting case. A uh, couple of thoughts. Um, I know the APOL1 testing wasn't considered uh, given the low prevalence in um, Somalia, but um, you know, given you know, we don't know if 
the family or her or she is like actually traveled within Africa. So whether she actually originated from a different part with a higher prevalence, that's a consideration. Um, and another thought was, uh, you know, collapsing. Clearly, there's a lot of different potential causes for it. Another thing I was thinking about here is, uh, you know, given the vascular disease that she has, whether that was a contributor, chronic vascular disease um, can also in some instances, especially in older individuals, uh, present with a kind of a collapsing phenotype that is not doesn't pre present as aggressively as what we classically think for collapsing FSGS. So just a couple of thoughts. Yeah, uh, just, good point. Sorry. sorry, just a couple of questions as well. Um, uh, it, it strikes me as a little odd to have collapsing FSGS in this setting. Um, and I wonder how, how convinced are we that this really is the case? Um, for example, those capillary loops are so stuffed with immune deposits, completely replacing everything. Could we not just have a capillary loop that's kind of broken down without leaving a lot of fibrin behind and that this really is not a collapsing FSGS lesion? Yeah, I think that it's uh, actually the, basically uh, it, it's an you can think of it as an spectrum because even if, if we look at the phenotype of the cells that are contributing into the um, uh, epithelial hyperplasia accumulation of the epithelial cells and collapsing on lofty, as you know, uh, we find uh, epithelial cells that they express markers of parietal cells or express both markers of parietal cells and podocytes, and so some that express podocytes. It is the other is it is similar. Maybe the proportion would be a little bit different if we look at the crescents, real crescents as well. So it's not an easy. There, I I don't think that there is an easy answer except if we find uh, that there is um, obvious evidence for glomerular based membrane break or necrosis. In this case, we did not find. Of course, we can't completely rule it, rule it out because as we know, again, uh, we in membranous nephropathy, rarely we can see crescent, but most of those cases that are associated with crescent and membranous nephropathy are not primary membranous nephropathy. They are secondary and most commonly to lupus nephritis, which is not the case here. It seemed that the prominent pathology besides membranous nephropathy in this case was segmental sclerosis. So putting everything together, we favor that this is not a crescent and this is collapsing FSGS. And, but, but it is not common in primary FSGS as you saw in, um, uh, the, in the other group coming from uh, the other paper that Yuran showed coming from um, uh, uh, Vancouver. Um, uh, if, although they had not at that time tested for PLA2R, but at least they um, looked for other causes such as HIV and other things that did not, did not find it. Whether there is really a phenotypical change as it is uh, characteristic of collapsing glomerulopathy, um, most likely yes, but I do not know if there is any reliable, easy way to look for that. I would, so I would just add that when we say collapsing glomerulopathy as a pathologist, we're talking about morphologic changes and that it's not a single entity. When you, a lot of, I think most of us, when we think of collapsing glomerulopathy, we're thinking about apol one associated collapsing glomerulopathy, which does have, you know, really bad prognosis, but there's many different uh, etiologies, as Ram mentioned, that can lead to this type of morphologic change. So really, you know, defining what is the pathophysiology that's, that's leading to this change is really important for us to really characterize the significance of the finding and what it might have for treatment or prognosis. So, you know, in this instance, you know, collapsing, it looks like collapsing glomerulopathy because it has morphologic features of collapsing glomerulopathy, but it, that doesn't mean that it's APOL1 associated collapsing glomerulopathy that's going to really uh, have an, an awful prognosis. Uh, I have a question for the pathology team. Um, we see a lot of uh, cases of glomerular ischemia caused by vascular disease, and I know ischemia is a cause of uh, collapsing glomerulopathy, especially with CNIs. But 
but we don't see it in every case of uh, every case of glomerular ischemia. So, are there reasons why some patients develop collapsing glomerulopathy and others don't? And in, in, in the context of ischemia, the, that I'm not aware of a study um, that has explored that, but. Uh, typically, it is um, associated with severe ischemia. That's the most typical form, such as in TMA or very severe arterial or hyalinosis uh, ischemia that targets uh, the glomerular in larger vessels uh, sources that can occur, but needs to be very significant. It's also been reported in transplant settings, so which I mean, you may, they may have CNI on board as well, but also in the context of vascular rejection too. So. I mean, I think your your point is well taken, Abal. I mean, there's definitely some a, an acute vascular component, um, and so maybe one way to think about it is, you know, the entire tuft. You can destabilize it either per, perhaps primarily from the vascular side, whether that's an ischemic thing. Anti-VEGF is another classic one to think about, right? TMA, or you can also then injure it from the podocyte side, like APOL1 primary thing, or some other types of you know, genetic lesions to the podocyte. And then many patients may have some kind of combination of those two, right? Um, and it may be hard to ascribe a, a, a pure etiology coming from one side or the other. Um, okay. There are no other okay. questions. Thanks. Great. Great discussion, thank you. Um, so you want, if you want to stop sharing, I'll, I'll start on my screen here. And um, Dr. Shannon and I will present um, this first case. Okay, I think you should be able to see my screen here. Um, okay, great. So, um, so this is a really interesting case that uh, um, was referred to us and Dr. Shannon has uh, follow up, followed up the patient as well. So um, let's get into it. Uh, and FYI, this, this picture was actually done by one of those um, uh, AI programs online. So I just asked for a kidney and stained glass and here you go. It's pretty amazing. All right, so Dr. Shannon, you wanna start with the clinical presentation? Brendan, are you there? I don't see him uh, online, actually. I see him on the yeah, call. Yeah, Brendan is but uh, he's mute. Oh, mute. Yeah. Okay, so well, maybe, um, maybe I'll start with this. So we'll kind of read through this. Um, and then um, if Brandon is able to jump in any time for more context, that's great. Um, so uh, this was a 32-year-old woman who was, you know, otherwise previously healthy um, um, and then did uh, and suffered a, a bout of COVID-19 in February of 2022, uh, along with many, many other people, of course. Now, after recovering from that episode um, in May of last year, she um, complained of being sick for about 10 days, uh, had some nausea, vomiting uh, multiple times, um, constipation, abdominal bloating, so a lot of GI symptoms, uh, along with uh, urinary frequency. And uh, she complained that this was kind of like a bad uh, stomach flu. Um, during that time, her weight also increased from 130 pounds to 175 pounds, so 40, 45 pound um, weight gain unintentional in uh, just under a week. So pretty dramatic uh, weight gain. A telemedicine visit at that time, um, uh, she was also found to have uh, elevated blood pressure and she was advised to have some Miralax to help with the constipation and uh, get her labs checked up if she, uh, if she was not uh, feeling any better. So following that uh, telemedicine visit, uh, she got her labs checked and was found to have a creatinine of 19 and so was referred immediately to the emergency department. Uh, around that time, she also noted that she had some kind of heavy uh, menses and was using uh, NSAIDs for symptomatic relief. Um, um, family history, um, she had like a 29-year-old brother, I believe was uh, healthy, and parents were in their 60s, all healthy as well, so really non-contributory for the family history. 
uh, immediate family history, um, though her paternal grandmother did have um, uh, end stage kidney disease uh, in her 60s, which was blamed on uh, diabetes. And um, same thing with a, a maternal uncle, uh, also in his 60s, uh, and attributed to type 2 diabetes. So on clinical exam, um, the, the, basically there was elevated uh, um, blood pressure as well. Uh, you can see that there was kind of traced to one plus uh, edema. Uh, white counts are here, platelets uh, are 210. Um, the peripheral blood smear did show some cystos schistocytes and her creatinine was um, uh, markedly uh, elevated as well. Uh, the, oh, I think Brendan is now off the phone. Um, and maybe he's able to join us here. Okay, I'm really sorry about that. This is oh, no, sort no of a semi urgent page. All right, um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you so, take the rest here. I'll give you a second hand uh, presentation of this case since this is someone that was in Bellingham um, that was seen by uh, outside nephrologist there. So, yeah, the first part of the history was basically that she had sort of this prodrome of 10 days of what she interpreted as the flu. And prior to that, really, her medical history was kind of unremarkable. She had been a tech worker in the Silicon Valley and had like a few sort of telemedicine visits um, over the years, like where her blood pressure, she said, was sort of high normal and they sort of made note of it, but it was not high enough to treat necessarily. So when she presented at the ER in Bellingham after having these uh, surprising lab results, you know, she was... The initial blood pressures ranged from 150 to the highest I saw recorded was 178 over 113. And her physical exam was recorded as really pretty unremarkable despite everything other than she had uh, a little bit of peripheral edema. And the labs were, no, other than her you know, kidney function, the most notable thing on her labs was the degree of anemia that she had where hemoglobin was 6.2. Uh -huh white count was normal. The platelets were actually normal. The automated peripheral smear was read as one plus schistocytes. Um, she had mild hyperkalemia, acidosis, um, and her automated UA had three plus protein, three plus blood, 10 to 14 white cells, three to five red cells, and what were interpreted as granular and waxy casts. Her serum albumin was 3.1. Her coags and LFTs were normal. Um, the complement C3 was 101 with the normal range there between 87 and 200, and her C4 was, thir was 39 uh, with the range of 13 to 50. They're also normal. Um, she got, uh, you know, kind of an extensive serologic evaluation. Her ANA was weakly positive with this diffuse speckled pattern uh, where they actually do the immunofluorescence staining there. Uh, ANCA panel was negative, uh, hepatitis and HIV serologies were negative. Her LDH was uh, pretty high, or the upper limits of normal. This is about 250. Um, her stool shigatoxin was negative. Adams TS13 was normal, and they do an ELISA there rather than presenting, rather than a percent, reporting a percentage like in our lab. So this was a normal result of basically one, where the range is point, from 0.6 to 1.6. She had anacardiolipin antibodies, lupus anticoagulant, and beta-2 glycoprotein uh, that were all negative. And um, she underwent a kidney biopsy in about, I think, hospital day two or three. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. So any uh, thoughts um, and potential causes for this kidney failure in uh, this young patient? Do you want to put it in the chat or shout them out? Hey, Brandon, uh, was the protein you quantified? Oh, sorry. Yeah, she had a protein to creatinine ratio about three, and I don't, I don't think I saw an albumin to creatinine ratio. So, any thoughts, ideas, what might be going on, what we might expect to see in the biopsy? Brendan, what were her complement levels? They were normal. Like C three is. Uh... 101, where the lower limits of normal is 87. I also should note that she had a peripheral smear done with a pathologist actually looking at it, and they did not see any schistocytes. I mean, she could still have been a limited uh, complement. She could have TME of the kidneys. She's hypertensive, has some blood in the urine, some protein in the urine. Her LDS is high. 
normal yeah, compliments would not rule that out. Okay. All right. So we have a vote for maybe renal limited TMA um, from Dr. Corrella. Okay. Let's uh, let's take a look. So uh, we received a um, a nice uh, biopsy. This is from um, the referring uh, uh, nephrologist at um, in Bellingham. And so we had uh, two nice cores of renal cortex. Uh, we had about a good sample of glomeruli, almost 42 in some, with only one globally sclerose. So really pretty well uh, um, intact um, glomerular parenchyma. You can see there's a little bit of a chronic injury with some of these um, tubules containing the, uh, 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 dilated by these large casts. But most of the renal parenchyma uh, appears relatively well-preserved with not a lot of chronic fibrosis or tubular atrophy. However, we start taking a closer look and we can see some abnormalities. We can see, for example, that uh, some of the tubules have a little bit more white space uh, apparent. And this is because there's a component of tubular injury. Uh, the epithelial cells are a little attenuated rather than being tall and columnar filling up the lumen. We can start seeing some abnormalities in the blood vessels. There's a couple of arteries here. We'll look at them in higher power. And the, um, the glomeruli look a little bit shriveled uh, as well. So we'll take a closer look at these. So and now I'm gonna show you several pictures of this. And these are really, you know, really kind of classic appearances uh, for, for this entity. And so here again, let's focus first on the glomeruli. You can see that rather than being nice and open and patent, if you remember from Dr. Wong's presentation in membranous, which is the exact opposite, where the capillary loops are all widely patent and actually almost uh, stiffly patent with all those uh, deposits. By contrast here, you don't see any white space in the, in the glomerular capillaries. They're basically, if you can imagine a shriveled up balloon or a raisin, that's really what has happened to these glomeruli. Um, they are under perfused, under inflated and kind of uh, shriveled up. You can again see the tubular injury over here, that the, there's some simplification of the epithelium. Uh, in some cases, even loss of epithelial cells here. Um, there's no epithelial cell covering the basement membrane in this case. Um, and here we can see a small vessel, um, which shows some dramatic changes with uh, marked swelling and also fragmentation of red blood cells, which have forced themselves into the vessel um, media as well. And so this is, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Corella mentioned, this is a, a a nice feature for a thrombotic microangiopathy. And it would make sense if the vessels look like this, where's the lumen for the vessel, right? So not much blood is getting through and that would explain why the glomeruli also appear shriveled and under perfused. So there were some additional interesting features. Again, we can see some ischemic up here, acutely ischemic looking uh, glomeruli. There were also one to two glomeruli which had what look like crescents. Um, so these are epithelial cell reactions in the urinary space. We didn't see a clear break in the base membranes to go along with it. And I'll show you another picture here in the, in the, in the next um, slide here. But there was some influx of inflammatory cells, including neutrophils into these uh, one rare glomeruli that were affected by crescents. Uh, and you can see that there are potentially foam cells associated here in some of these capillary loops and these very reactive epithelial cells um, uh, uh, occupying the urinary space. So very focal, like one to two glomeruli out of up to 42. So um, rare, but it was present. Uh, here you can also see some very focal, uh, some uh, uh, tubular injury, of course, but also a little bit of tubular interstitial nephritis in the immediate uh, vicinity of this glomerulus uh, with this uh, crescent-like lesion. A single glomerulus also showed really prominent influx of foam cells or foamy macrophages that was literally stuffing all the capillary loops. Again, this was a, a, a rare finding with only the single glomerulus showing this, um, this uh, pattern. And then we could see many other glomeruli, of course, had this ischemic appearance. And here you can almost capture the, the, the injury in action here. You can see the hilar uh, arteriole of this um, core glomerulus as uh, acutely injured. You can see here are some of the endothelial cells, perhaps the residua of the lumen. And you can see an accumulation of this bright pink fibrin-like material uh, and thrombosis essentially that has uh, completely uh, occluded this vessel. 
which would explain why um, this whole glomerulus looks ischemic and underperfused, perhaps with another foam cell here, and perhaps with some fibrin accumulation. Perhaps this was the precursor uh, for some of those, um, uh, those rare crescentic lesions that we saw as well. So another look at the vessels uh, in other parts of the biopsy, again, show some of these changes of uh, acute TMA. So here's another uh, small vessel here showing features very similar to the, the one that was affecting that glomerulus. A lot of fibrin accumulation, swelling of the endothelial cells, really compressing or occluding the lumen, uh, which might have been over here, uh, and perhaps also some uh, attachment of uh, inflammatory cells like this foamy macrophage um, as well. Here's a different kind of injury pattern. Here we can see you know, intimal swelling and swelling of the endothelial cells. Um, and this kind of loose gray, a blue gray kind of material, uh, um, which uh, was sometimes referred to as mucoid uh, uh, intimal degeneration or mucoid edema. And all of this is again, causing uh, narrowing of the lumen. And you can imagine that not much um, blood is getting through these, uh, these vessels. Now, interestingly, in this case, the immunofluorescence was generally negative. We had a good sample again, about 14 glomeruli. There was some segmental accentuation for fibrin, uh, which is not surprising given the extent of injury that we were seeing um, with occasional fibrin accumulation in some of these glomeruli and possible crescent formation. But uh, pertinent negative here, there, were, there was no significant immune complex um, deposition. When we took a look at the IF, um, those glomeruli in that sample also had a very similar appearance. Here's one of the gloms that was uh, scoped. So again, kind of looking acutely ischemic, we're not seeing the white space of the capillary loops where red blood cells would be. The whole thing seems kind of scrunched down. And this is kind of confirmed uh, on the ultrastructural examination as well. So this is kind of a low medium power view. And here what you're seeing these structures, these kind of ill-defined gray blobs are the capillary loops that are just kind of compressed down. We can see some of the epithelial cells on, on the overlying them are kind of reactive as well. And we're not seeing much of a lumen or white space uh, in here, which kind of matches the appearance we were seeing by light microscopy and in the screening sections. Um, here's another view. Again, you can see this compressed capillary tuft. Very hard to see the lumen here. Some of these might be swollen endothelial cells or even uh, uh, some inflammatory cells like a neutrophil coming in. Um, uh, and some of these might also be monocytes that are coming in. You can again see the, this kind of very reactive appearance for the epithelial cells, the photocytes um, with effacement of their foot processes as well. And again, another view saying, uh, showing perhaps some expansion of the subendothelial space, interposition of cells, um, some ongoing remodeling, uh, and uh, really just overall just uh, under perfusion and distortion of the capillary tufts. So the, the diagnosis we rendered here, um, it was very apparent even just by light microscopy was that this is an acute thrombotic microangiopathy. Um, and it's, of course, ischemic glomerulopathy we thought was secondary to this, of course. Um, the crescent was a little bit of a puzzle, but um, we felt that this was uh, favored to represent kind of an aggressive reaction to this acute injury, perhaps occasional uh, fibrin mediated, you know, uh, fibrin associated a breakage of um, capillary loops resulting in some crescent formation. Um, uh, and of course, some of the other things were secondary like the uh, acute tubular injury. But at this stage, there was very mild chronic injury overall, um, but really kind of a, almost a single line diagnosis to uh, kind of explain um, the, the patient's acute presentation was acute thrombotic microangiopathy. So I can turn it over. Perhaps, uh, um, Brendan, do you want to take, take over here? Um, so also, I would say that you know, in our differential, we, we invoke, I mean, there are many, many different causes for TMA. Um, and so uh, the question is, you know, whether uh, um, this patient could fit into some of these diverse categories to try to maybe define what might be the etiology or the cause uh, in this particular individual. Sure. Um, sure. Hey, uh... So to answer Christine's question, we did specifically ask about gin and tonics, and she did not um, um, drink that. Brendan was. Uh... Uh, was there any feature of scleroderma or, or anti-RNA polymerase? Anti no, her, uh, so that ANA was like a fluke um, in the, the panel. The ANA panel was negative and a repeat 
regular NA screen was negative. And, and she doesn't use cocaine or No, no. Okay. So I think, uh, I guess from the clinician point of view, when you encounter thrombotic microangiopathy, histology, sort of the, the, um, the key thing is to um, see if, to determine if it is, um, I guess, a primary um, form that's associated with the complement disorders, or I guess to exclude primarily like TTP and uh, diarrhea associated uh, HUS would be sort of the the first steps because and um, because they are uh, statistically more common. So she had that evaluation with uh, shigatoxin being negative and Adams 13 being negative. Also, the lack of uh, um, you know other systemic manifestations that you might see more commonly in TTP uh, was absent. Um, and her platelets were also normal, which was a little less consistent with those causes and then um if you and then she didn't have other infections that would uh that would uh, suggest another secondary cause so that kind of leaves the category of a primary thrombotic macroangiopathy and the two big categories there are if it the causes that are related to genetic variants and those that are autoimmune and related to antibodies against various components in the complement cascade. Uh, Brenda, there was a question from um, Glenda about uh, what caused the rapid weight gain for the patient. I think it was about yeah, 45 I'd, pounds. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I, I would sort of presume fluid retention, but you know, her, the, I, I guess I, w I should say, you know, they only like documented a little bit of edema, but she did have ascites and lots of subcutaneous edema and some of the on one of the CT scans, she said, so presumably just rapid fluid retention. I think Ashley had a question too. Um, yeah, just before uh, Brendan tells us the uh, complement workup, um, there was a paper from Chris Larson a few years back looking at glomerular sparing of TMA when you saw a mostly large vessel or non-capillary TMA that it was less likely to be to have underlying genetic variants. So I'm just wondering, in this biopsy, to me, it looked like it was there was sort of glomerular sparing, but would you just, was I correct? Yeah, that, that, uh, it definitely seemed more proximal, if, you, if that's uh, the best term for it. Uh, so the hilar arterioles were involved, the larger vessels were also involved. Um, I will have to look up that paper from uh, Dr. Larson. Um, as well, but uh, that was definitely the the pattern that we were seeing here. That it seemed much more proximal, and everything downstream, including the glomeruli, were then uh, secondarily affected. Okay, let's continue. So she had um, a, a complement functional panel. It was sent out to Mayo Clinic that was most notable for this abnormality and the terminal uh, component where that was slightly elevated suggesting some overactivity of the alternative pathway in general her c3 level was sort of low low normal and really the other the other components were relatively uh were relatively unremarkable so there the lab's interpretation of this was that um that, you know, this is the, the pulled directly from the lab. So they, they thought that the C5, that the uh, terminal uh, membrane attack component, um, component could be elevated just because of activation after blood draw. Um, and they didn't see other significant evidence of complement activation. And they also thought it was a little odd that C5 didn't seem to be inhibited despite the fact that she was receiving a cluzumab already at the time of the uh, the, when these were sent, I think maybe one dose she had received. Yeah. So they also did a genetic testing panel concurrent with this, which includes 13 genes, some of which are associated with complement related a, uh, HUS and some of which are not like DGKE. And this showed 
a missense variant in C3, which results, which is which results in an amino acid change from lysine to glutamine towards the end at position 65, which is towards the end terminal or proximal part of the gene. And uh, lysine is a positively charged or has a positively charged um, side chain and glutamine has a neutral side chain. Yeah. And um, so what we were left with was kind of a lot of mixed, <laughs> mixed information. We had a peripheral smear without much in the way of cystocytes. We had a, a really profound uh, aggressive TMA on kidney biopsy. We had sort of a unremarkable fun complement functional assay and we had a missense variant and the um, c3 component of complement um, and so when you see a missense variant like that it's the question is always is this just you know unremarkable variation or could this be a pathogenic variation so the testing lab graded it as a pathogenic variant um, a variety of other labs you know in the have reported this as very variants a, a variant of uncertain significance um, but it does turn out that there was a publication on this specific variant from oh, sorry we're going to that sorry from 2012 that um, that had performed functional assays on the specific variant so they were able to generate recombinant uh, protein uh, a recombinant version of C3 that contained this genetic variant where there was a glutamine in, in place of the um, lysine, and they showed that it had reduced uh, ability to be, um, um, that the C3B fraction had reduced ability to interact with complement factor H, which is one of the inhibitors of the alternative complement pathway. So this was a, basically a gain of function mutation where C3B was less susceptible to the um, inherent uh, inhibitory action of complement factor H. Yeah, I would, I would say that also this, this lysine mutation is completely conserved across all species. Right. Uh, except yeah. the, um, I think it may be in macaques, but rhesus monkeys. They, yeah. 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 One of those monkeys. And then, but they have actually an arginine in that position, which is also another positively charged um, amino acid. And the reason for that positive charge is important because then it uh, uh, forms some hydrogen bonding with a negatively charged glutamic acid on factor H. So if you were to change the charge interactions by changing to say like a glutamine in this patient, then uh, it's, it doesn't um, bind together as, as tightly. So the thought here perhaps is that, you know, this, uh, because of this uh, mutation uh, from um, lysine to glutamine and a reduced um, binding ability to factor H, that uh, the alternative pathway uh, convertase uh, with C3BB and BB, uh, um, C3B and BB factor BB is uh, going to persist longer and perhaps uh, 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 activate complement on endothelial cells um, to cause uh, damage. And so, but there are still some peculiarities in this case, right? I mean, the, the complement levels weren't markedly low. Um, they were kind of in the low normal range. There was kind of a renal limited uh, um, pathology, as far as we could tell. Um, the presence of schistocytes was kind of a little bit wishy washy. Um, and uh, the functional testing for complement also didn't uh, reveal, you know, a clear um, dysfunction. Um, so there are still a little bit of uh, some questions that are left uh, and answered here, but there is that the possibility that, you know, um, that this individual has just an increased tendency to uh, um, uh, keep uh, the alternative con complement uh, con convertase active uh, when it is activated because of that inability of factor H uh, or reduced efficiency of factor H to bind to C3B. Now, one other thought that 
I had, you know, as we were putting this thing together is whether, you know, that antecedent COVID she had about three to four months prior to uh, her acute presentation might have contributed to this. Um, and there's some work that has been done in terms of, um, you know, COVID uh, affecting the, um, uh, the um, uh, complement cascade. And here's a, a, a nice study that was done with actually recombinant proteins. Um, where if you were to actually look at a, a complement deposition assay on uh, model cells in culture, if you were to take normal uh, human serum, um, it um, deposits only a little bit of C3, but in the presence of spike protein from complement, you uh, spike protein from uh, SARS-CoV-2, you accelerate the amount of complement deposition uh, onto the cells. And factor H is able to inhibit it to some, uh, to some degree. So these authors uh, suggested that um, SARS-CoV-2 is able to kind of interrupt this interaction between C3B and factor H um, by preventing factor H from binding to C3B. So again, kind of speculation in this, in, in, in this particular case, but this patient already had a mutation which would uh, reduce the efficiency of factor H binding to C3B to accelerate the, the decay of the C, uh, alternative pathway convertase. And we wonder whether SARS-CoV-2 in this case might have accelerated that um, to really uh, trigger some of the um, acute endothelial cell injury um, that she had. Okay, so I will um, stop there for this, uh, this, uh, this particular case. If there are any questions, we're happy to take them. What do you mean, Abal, about not likely from ischemia? Oh, no, no. I think Leah was asking. I didn't realize I sent it to everyone, but Leah was asking if uh, you had any comments on the crescents. Is, is it from ischemia or like GVM disruption because of the endothelial swelling? And, and... Yeah, um, that was a bit of a puzzle. Um, and I mean, there, there was definitely neutrophil influx here, but we have, you know, clear endothelial cell injury, you know, pretty diffusely through the biopsy. Um, there was at least one glomerulus that I showed also that show, um, looked like it had some segmental fiber and accumulation within the capillary loops. So, um, you know, I basically thought that there was perhaps there was a focal break here or there. I think ANCAs might have been checked. Um, I think I recommended, um, you know, the referring nephrologist to at least check ANCAs just to rule that out. Um, but I favored that it was just kind of an exuberant reaction to this, you know, very severe uh, injury that we had uh, in the biopsy. But I, I didn't favor that it was a primary crescentic process per se. I should say that she um, really got pretty aggressive um, treatment, you know, diagnosis and treatment like pretty rapidly. Like her biopsy was, I think she was admitted on the third, her biopsy was like the sixth or the seventh, and they started a clusumab like by the ninth, so like less than a week from admission. And she got about a month, I think a month of a clusumab and um really wasn't showing improvement unfortunately and so i think they just stopped it after maybe six weeks or something like that um i guess one question would be was that long enough or not you know i don't know you know i hate to kind of yeah i don't know um and but where is she at now brendan she lives in bellingham and uh okay. So she has been referred for transplant, which is another interesting mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And she's just started the evaluation for that. So I guess the question is, you know, some programs would have, a, you know, the, the recurrent in that paper from 2012, the report on three cases, they all had transplants, all with recurrent disease in the transplant. And that's definitely been reported. Um, and so some programs would take a monitoring approach for that, or some programs would use a, you know, close the map uh, right after, or before, or right after transplant. So it, I'm kind of interested to see what the approach for that would be. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so with that, with this uh, extended director's cut of uh, biopsy conference, we will go on to our third case. Um, and this is a case. Uh, that I set together with Dr. Ng. Um, and so let's, let's begin. Yoren, are you there? Yep. 
Mary, so this is a 35-year-old lady who underwent a living unrelated kidney transplant in April 2022. A little bit about her kidney history. She was first diagnosed with diabetes and hypertension when she was pregnant with her twins in 2016. Her diabetes was during pregnancy a little bit hard to control. So she was treated with insulin and later on postpartum, her blood sugars were better. And so she was switched over to metformin. And in terms of her hypertension, she was um, documented to be very hypertensive throughout her pregnancy. And with that, she developed worsening peritoneuria resulting in a preterm C-section um, at 33 weeks. Her kidney function throughout the pregnancy has been in the normal range of 0.5 to 0.7. Um, and as you can see, the peritoneuria was increasing throughout pregnancy, which was why she underwent a C-section. So according to the patient, um, postpartum, she was told to follow up uh, in terms of her diabetes and her high blood pressure. And she did follow up with her primary care doctor. As far as she knew, she was never told that she had kidney problems. Um, next slide, please. Um, unfortunately, in February 2021, she presented to Valley with severe cough and shortness of breath. And with that, um, she was diagnosed with COVID. But what was also oh striking was the admission lab showed a BUN and creatinine of 50 and a, a creatinine of 7.8. So with her increasing oxygen requirement, um, they tried diuretics. She didn't really respond to diuretics. And the decision was made to initiate her on uh, kidney replacement therapy. So she was started on dialysis in February 2021. She was referred to us for transplant. Um, we did an extensive workup on her. And basically, she underwent a living unrelated kidney transplant from one of her colleagues in, Feb in April of 2022. She had a very prolonged hospital stay due to uh, difficulties in controlling her blood sugar and difficulty in controlling her pain. Um, and next slide, please. Um, Unfortunately, uh, post-transplant, the other problem that we struggled with her with was her side effects. So she had a lot of side effects with regards to her medications, a lot of nausea, vomiting, and a lot of stressors at home as well, um, which resulted in um, less frequent lab testing. She just couldn't get to labs. And um, in October 2022, so about 5.5 months after her transplant, she presented to Valley Emergency Room with a creatinine of 11, um, an undetectable tacrolimus level, two plus, pro two plus proteinuria, trace blood in the urine, and also was found to have new DSAs, which um, previously was negative. So we did a biopsy. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Yohan. So uh, any thoughts here? Rejection, perhaps. <laughs> so, you know, perhaps inadequate immunosuppression, there's new DSAs, creatinines um, elevated. So, um, and as we shall see, that is the case. Uh, but the reason why we're presenting this is that it's a really, really nice dramatic case of uh, a lot of different kinds of rejections, so especially for the the fellows uh, and trainees on the, on, on the Zoom uh, take note of some of these images because they're nice uh, uh, nice teaching cases. Let's see, there's a question in the chat. Not taking meds, that uh, I think was the key. Yeah, the tacrolimus level was uh, undetectable um, for perhaps a variety of reasons, social reasons, but uh, let's take a look. Okay, so we received a really good uh, sample. We had about two pores consisting predominantly of renal cortex, but even though there were only uh, these two nice long cores, they only contained about four to six glomeruli per level section of which one were uh, was globally sclerosed. So um, not a huge sampling of glomeruli. However, we can see even at this low power that rather than being bright pink, there's a lot of bluish kind of uh, changes here. And that's gonna be the general uh, theme when we look through the next few uh, images. So pretty much anywhere along this core, if we were to take a look, this was kind of the, the, uh, the findings we were gonna see. So a ton of inflammation, a lot of tubulitis uh, as well. So just diffusely uh, affecting the entire biopsy core associated with a lot of interstitial edema, this kind of looser gray uh, material is interstitial fluid that's really pushing apart all the tubules uh, and uh, causing the, the, the kidney to be very edematous. 
So here's a higher power uh, view of that. And so you can see just this overrunning inflammation just taking over the entire parenchyma. Here you can see the basement membranes of some of these tubules. And you can see that they're dissolving. They're just getting destroyed by this inflammatory process. You can see the small uh, dark blue cells, the nuclei here. These are the, the inflammatory cells, the, the leukocytes that have made their way into the, uh, the epithelial cell layer. So this is a very severe tubulitis and extensive interstitial inflammation, with, which is very active in appearance. And we call it active because it's associated with all this interstitial edema and very little fibrosis. So I mentioned there were only a few glomeruli. Um, they were relatively unremarkable. Uh, there didn't seem to be any underlying uh, disease. Uh, um, uh, and also there wasn't much in terms of uh, inflammatory cell influx into the glomeruli. But again, you can see right next door, the tubular interstitium is extremely inflamed, kind of a mixed um, uh, inflammatory cell population. And again, the way we identify tubulitis is we're looking for these kind of hyperchromatic small lymphocyte nuclei kind of tucked into the epithelial cell layer as defined by the base membrane. And you can see the much larger uh, tubular epithelial cells with kind of larger nu uh, nuclei as well. So these cells are the inflammatory cells that have entered into the epithelial cell layer uh, uh, as we're defining um, tubulitis here and rejection. Oops. So the peritubular capillaries were another a point that we were trying to identify. And because there was just this overrunning inflammation, it was sometimes hard to, to see them. But when we could see them, you could see here is one outlined, they too were full of inflammatory cells. Now, this, uh, when we see uh, you know, peritubular capillary congestion, when we see a lot of interstitial edema, um, especially in the context of you know, new DSA uh, in this patient, uh, antibody mediated rejection also comes into play. Um, we did not see glomerulitis as another marker of microvascular inflammation. But when we did, when we were able to see the peritubular capillaries, they were pretty stuffed with uh, um, uh, leukocytes. Here's actually another profile of a peritubular capillary over here. And again, you can see that it's filled uh, with lymphocytes. And again, you can see this extensive in active inflammation just kind of running over the entire parenchyma. Here's another view again uh, to uh, identify those peritubular capillaries. And you can see here one outlined over here. This is probably another peritubular capillary adjacent to this base membrane. And again, uh, so this was uh, basically categorized as kind of a PTC3, the highest level of peritubular capillary congestion um, uh, as a hallmark of microvascular inflammation. So here's another view of this really aggressive looking tubulitis. Uh, and again, I, I'm bringing this up uh, just as an example of uh, the T3 lesion, the highest degree of uh, tubulitis by the BAMF scoring scheme. And again, here, one of the, the defining features here, if you were to follow this black base membrane of the tubule, it disappears. It disappears here where all these inflammatory cells have destroyed the, uh, the base membrane, have entered the epithelial cell layer, you can see um, the sloughing of the epithelial cells into the lumen uh, as well and denudation. So this is a, a severe um, a T3 type of lesion in the context of just diffuse uh, active inflammation involving the majority of the parenchyma. So this was categorized as a T3 and I3 um, by the BAMF scoring scheme. Now, another feature that was uh, present in this biopsy were that there were, uh, even though the inflammatory cells were kind of a mixed population, we see small lymphocytes, we see some larger bean-like cells, probably monocytes and macrophages. There were also collections of these type of cells known as plasma cells, which have kind of an eccentric clockwork face nucleus, kind of a skirt of uh, um, uh, amphophilic or purplish cytoplasm, with the little perinuclear clearing, which is where the Golgi apparatus is. So these are plasma cells and there are clusters of these plasma cells um, all through the, the, the biopsy. Um, and so when we see plasma cells, a couple of things come to mind. And in the context of transplants, we think about you know, uh, polyomavirus infection. We did a stain for SV40T antigen to test for that, it was negative. Um, and so barring infection, um, and especially when we see an ag aggressive rejection process like this, uh, we can also put a, assign a label of plasma cell rejection process, which 
in several studies uh, has been associated with kind of a more aggressive uh, course. Now these plasma cells here, you can see another uh, aggregate of them over here. And you can even see them invading into and destroying the tubules as well as part of the tubulitis. And so here you can see a tubular profile that's uh, you know, pretty much occupied by all these uh, uh, plasma cells. So what about the vessels? Okay, so here's a, a small vessel here and uh, it's, it's completely distorted because the entire uh, um, intimal layer has been lifted up. So here are the endothelial cells and undermining the, uh, the endothelial cells are inflammatory leukocytes. And this encompasses the entire profile of this vessel. Um, and so if it's greater than 25% in a couple of arteries by BAMP, this is a, it's a V2 lesion uh, so far. However, when we dug deeper into the levels, we were able to actually see where this inflammation, which is undermining underneath the endothelial cell layer, actually punches through the wall of, of the vessel here. You can see fraying of the, the muscular layer and the intimal layers of, the, um, of this blood vessel. And the inflammation kind of is continuous with the surrounding inflammation uh, in the parenchyma as well. So we categorize this as a, a V3 lesion since we have transmural uh, um, arteritis uh, as well. So, so far by light microscopy, we had kind of a diffuse interstitial inflammation uh, um, and tubulitis, T3 and I3. We had um, prominent peritubular capillary congestion at a PDC3. And uh, in addition, we had uh, uh, transmural arteritis to satisfy a V3 lesion. Interestingly, we did not see glomerulitis. Now, what about that DSA? So, uh, so immunofluorescence uh, also showed a diffuse staining of the peritubular capillaries for C4D. So again, here are the tubular profiles in the shadows and tucked between them are all the peritubular capillaries, which again are kind of open and dilated, uh, kind of, kind of consistent with what we saw by light microscopy. And so there was a diffuse, strong staining of these peritubular capillaries for C4D. And so this is again categorized as a C4D3 uh, type of lesion by, by BAMF uh, scoring scheme. So again, perhaps no surprises here in terms of the ultimate diagnosis, but the reason why we're presenting this case is because it's a really, you know, really um, dramatic um, um, scoring in terms of all the types of scoring schemes that we would do by BAMF. And so we diagnose this as a plasma cell rich, severe active T cell rejection with a vascular rejection as well. Uh, also active antibody mediated rejection. And because of these high scores here, it would meet the criteria for a BAMF3 um, uh, rejection, which we don't see uh, very often. Back to you, Johan. Uh, actually, this was a slide before. <laughs> this was before her biopsy. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, the, no, it's okay. It's okay. I, sorry, I didn't. I didn't realize that this slide was still there. Uh, no, this was basically what happened to her after the transplant. So we struggled a lot with her um, medications with side effects, and also struggled a lot with um, social situations at home. And these labs are actually all labs before she got the biopsy. So, okay. um, and. And just a little bit of uh, update. Um, so she received thymoglobulin for this rejection. And um, fortunately, fortunately, um, she did respond. So she was initiated on dialysis when she presented. We were able to get her off dialysis and um, we're about four months from that episode now, um, she has a creatinine of about three, which is not great because her creatinine before she came in was around one, um, but she's um, holding steady at around three right now. So, and just one comment, it's it's not something that we want to see. Like, I, I think it's very exciting pathology, but it, it really, as a transplant nephrologist, it really is something that we don't want to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And it's and thankfully, we don't see it very often as well. And so that's why uh, we presented it today to kind of demonstrate how aggressive some of these rejection processes can be. Uh, and since we don't see them very often, to just kind of show those kind of textbook lesions um, that can occur.
sorry, Yuhorn, um, it's Leah, just for um, us on the non-transplant side. So when you see both severe T-cell rejection and severe antibody rejection, is thymoglobulin alone the usual treatment or you don't do anything, any rituxan or phoresis or anything like that? So. Um. So, so thymoglobin does have some um, action against B cells as well. So we always start with that. Um, it, I think different people will do it differently. Different centers have different protocols. So some would do thymoglobin and then do plasma phoresis and IVIG. In her case, I started with the thymoglobin and then basically watched her antibodies and her self-free DNA. And fortunately for her, her self-free DNA um, when she came in was very high, I think it was four or five. And then right now it's about 0 0.1, 0 0.2. She does still have mm -hmm. a, a donor specific antibody at a stable mm -hmm. level. It's actually improving a little bit, although not very much, but her self-free DNA has been very stable. And because her kidney function was getting better, I, I have not um, added new treatment, but that was the plan. Um, if the thymo didn't bring down her levels um, or her kidney function didn't improve, that would have been what I would have done. Was there a question in the chat about bilatacept? Um, as a as a maintenance agent uh, or as a oh, so I see for for adherence, um, it, it is an option. I think you know. I I think ultimately it's it's a it's a shared decision with the patient. I, it's definitely one of the things that um, you know is is touted to be one of the ways to manage adherence because you know that they come, but then we've also had situations when they don't come and then that would be like two months of no treatment. So um, I think ultimately, um, you know, what I learned from this case is um, to work very closely with the patient and, and I have been working very closely with her and also with the psychiatrist to try to better manage the situation. And, and so far we're good. We're not perfect, but we're, we're managing it better. Yeah, that's a good Sorry, Abba. Was it only the tacrolimus or she was also struggling to take prednisone and Celsept? Uh, all, so I think if it was only the tacrolimus, we may not have seen such, she basically struggled with, and actually it was the mycophenolate that she struggled the most with because of the nausea vomiting. I think that was the one that she really struggled with. And I think just um, at some point in time, it just became between what was happening at home and, and her side effects of the medication, it just became too overwhelming. So it was actually all three. Well, I'm glad that she's doing better despite those challenges and a very uh, angry looking biopsy. So that's, um, that's uh, definitely progress in the right direction. So, um, and thank you, Chris, um, Dr. Blossom for the comment about uh, including the BAMF uh, scoring as well in th these biopsies and to Dr. Leka as well. So, all right, if there are no further questions, we can, uh, and this extended director's cut of uh, a biopsy conference here and give you back 10 minutes uh, to return to your day. Thanks, Rob. Uh, and uh, thanks everyone for being here. We'll uh, see everyone back in two weeks at Nephrology Grand Rounds. Have a good weekend.